Hello everyone, Nigel here with you, Nigel's Modeling Bench, and here we are with another book review, and by the title you already know what this is. This is a book that a lot of people have been waiting for, a lot of people requested. I think this will be one of Wing Leader's biggest ever sellers, along with the Lancaster. But um, just start off as normal, just by showing you, if you want to get this book, if you order it direct from Wing Leader from their website, um, this is how it will come to you, and it's Book World Wholesale. So it comes in a plastic bag which is sealed and watertight, so if it's raining your book won't get damp. It comes in a cardboard envelope, so if the postman drops it, it won't damage your book. And it comes in a bubble wrap envelope inside the cardboard, inside the plastic sleeve, so it can get damp, cold, dropped or whatever, and your book will arrive, like this one, in perfect condition. Notice no dog ears, no nothing. I was very disappointed, I ordered a book a few, uh, few months back. Um, it's quite an expensive book and it actually came from America and they put it in a jiffy bag and it came with all the corners damaged Right, so just bear that in mind So here we have the Douglas Boston Havoc in RAF service Northwest Europe Right, I'm going to start here by saying what I normally do when I do these book reviews I have a quick flip through I pick out a few certain bits that you know you're going to point out and and go for the review with this, I would take it would take me a day to do that, and I've only just received this book about an hour ago, so I haven't done that. I've gone through and picked up a few bits and pieces, but this book is absolutely cram packed, full of really interesting points I never even knew about this aircraft. What a thing this was! What a tool this aircraft was! I know that it was used. You know, all over the world, it was used in Australia, in Russia, it went over to Africa, it was used by the RAF, it was used by the French, it was used by the Americans. Unbelievable bloody thing. Unbelievable. I also didn't know that some were built by Boeing. So, got that from this book as well. So, as usual, lovely wing leader, nice glossy cover. There's the ISBN number there, should you want to order it from somewhere else. That's where you can get it, wingleader.co.uk, and look at that. It is still 1995. I've got a model magazine over here, which is just a normal off the shelf model magazine, and it's 599. And yet you can get one of these books for 1995. Incredible value in this day and age when you think how things have gone up. It's I don't know how Mark does it. He keeps the price at that at that 1995 level. I don't know how he's done it, but um, still we won't complain. <laughs> so we have a lovely glossy cover, lovely colour image on the front. And we also have some lovely images there of the uh, Boston or the Havoc. Um, I'll just read out the foreword. Uh, this is number. This is book number 28. Um, I'll just read out the foreword because it's very poignant to what I just said. Um, while I was working on this book, someone asked me, so what's the difference between a Boston and a Havoc? I was just about to com confidently say that the Havoc was a night fighter and the Boston a bomber. Then I remembered the Boston three intruders. OK, no problem, I thought. Havoc had the smaller tail. But then I remembered the Havoc Mark II. In short, just like the P-40, the lineage of the Boston is far from simple, but we have done our very best to explain it all in this book. And you're going to have to get it and read it, because I'm not going to tell you, because I, I can't find the, the, all the differences. I'm delighted to welcome renowned profile artist Joanita Franzi to the series with her excellent set of Bostons and Havocs contained here. Joanita has a remarkable ability to weather her profiles, a skill that is particularly useful when portraying matte black painted night fighters. I'd also like to thank Mark Harbour for contributing his knowledge on the technical side of the Boston, which has really helped us to dig deeper into the photos that you will find here. Once again, our author Andy Thomas has dug out some of the very rare and interesting photos of RAF Boston Havocs in operational service. So many, in fact, that we had to drop all the North Africa and Italy content for a future volume. So we're going to get another one, guys. That's good news. And that's from Mark Postlethwaite, who's the series editor. I met Mark at Telford this year. What a great guy. Brilliant. Uh, really glad I've met him. Didn't realise he actually lives in Poland. And he's one of the most English-speaking gentlemen you'll ever meet. And he's lived there for years. So, um, yeah, the profiles are by Uanita. I'm sorry if I've slaughtered your name. Uanita Franzi. Um, Franzi uh, Uanita Franzi Aero Illustrations. And they are really nice as well. And you've got your normal modeler's notes and everything. And most photos saw from www.wingleaderarchive.com. The largest online private collection of World War II aviation images. Sign up now. I'm going to be doing a review of that. 
Um, I had forgotten to do it because I've had so much to do and so much going on in my life beside modelling it um, lately. Um, and I need to do a review of that. I've forgotten to do it. I've got access to that, uh, that wonderful site and um, I'm going to do a review of it and tell you all about it. So here we go. Beautiful black and white image. RAF Northwestern Europe Operations. So, introduction. There's the first DBC to see action in World War II. You can see that in the bare metal finish with the French markings. So that's all looking uh, lovely. And then here we've got a group of civilians inspecting some finished aircraft. We've got a pilot there with his hatch open. Lovely close-up detailed image there of the, the riveting detail around that hatch. And you can see here how the, the nose wheel sort of cants over. It's because the, the nose gear is sort of angled forwards. I've got my Boston here. I'm working on it. Or Havoc, should I say. And the nose wheel's angled forward. So as it turns, the, the sort of... The, the wheel takes on a bit of caster, so that, that's a very interesting uh, look. Um, and you can see here they're talking about the, um, the locations of the bulge fairings of the external nose gun, not fitted, and the covered aperture for the internally cavalry gun are also evident. And was more about that later. So going over the page here, we have a really interesting scheme. So this was a night fighter that was covered in a, an olive... What do they call it? A uh, dum 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 dum. An olive, extra dark sea grey and olive grey that extended only along part of the fuselage. So that would be an interesting little subject to make, wouldn't it? When I was with Mark, I actually introduced Neil to him because um, I think Neil was very interested in this book for his upcoming Havocs and stuff. And I asked the question of Neil, are you going to produce an early Havoc you know, without the turret? And his response was yes. But somebody else told me, he asked him, and he said no. So I'm not sure if he understood the question. So we shall have to wait and see. We've got the JK coming. And the JK is basically a glass nose GH. So that would be really interesting. But there's lots of little bits and pieces. And if you saw it at Alfred, you'd have seen all the bits of orange and everything there. So um, interesting picture there with all the weathering. You can see all the chip paint and everything. And you can see the, the pre-shading on the panel lines that everybody says is not accurate, including me. And you can see here is all the uh, all the lines there. But that's a really well-kept plane. It must be quite new. Again, it's got those horrible hubcaps on it, which I do not like the look of. But uh, that's just my opinion. And what does that count for? Um, so here we can see, this is something I never knew about. Like We're in page six. And here's something that probably most of you did not know. An early form of Shrak music. They actually built an A20... With, upward, with angled up guns. They weren't f completely upward facing, but they were angled up. And then there's a gun sight here for the guns facing upwards. So they actually did that in an A20. So go get yourself this book and read all about it. There is a beautiful wartime colour image of a... It's, it looks like it's probably um, a setup for a... You know, for a um, magazine or something or a newspaper. But uh, it's beautiful, isn't it? It really is nice. Very nice indeed. You notice the open uh, cooling holes there in the engine covers. They're mentioned a lot in this book. Um, the six outboard and two inboard cooling holes were on all Boston Mark III's and often misidentified as tropical cowlings. European Boston Bostons had European based Bostons even had the holes, but they were generally plated over as they weren't needed in cooler European skies. So they're actually openings, they're not flapped panels, they're actually holes. So uh, bear that in mind for your version, whatever you're modelling. So going over the page here, again, lovely black and white image of some uh, Bostons. And here you can see quick recognition guide, I'm not going to go through it all, but we can see here the difference in the tails. We've got the different nose configurations. You can see this has got the, the stepped glazing. This has got the angled glazing. This has got the one-piece glazing. We've got the different style, um, the rear of the nacelle, the, the, the pointy bit on the back. You can see it's longer and pointier on the later aircraft. We've got the turreted Mark IV, and we've got the uh, <clears throat> the DF loop on the Mark III and IV. And then we've got the difference of the intakes. You can see here the air intake is right to the front. Then on the Mark II and III they brought it back, and then on the Mark III they brought it forward, and then on the Mark IV they took it back, on the Mark IV they took it back again. So, again, um, all interesting stuff. And over here we've got a picture of the cockpit. So this is going to be an early cockpit. You can see here the shape of that cowling, and you can see here how the instrument panel is not as deep as the HK models has it, but um, it is still quite deep in there. 
Night Fighters and Intruders, you can see, look at the weathering on that, look at the, how the paint is just falling off. It's incredible, absolutely gorgeous to model. This one here as well, you can see, and it'll be showing all the camouflage underneath. Note as well, they've got the great big exhaust pipes. We've got three others here. It's interesting as well to see that the, the serial codes, like this one is YPS, this one is YPW, and this one's YPT. But they've got the S, W, and T on the nose, and they also repeat it on the tail. So um, very interesting because I guess they couldn't get all three in there and use the standard RAF, you know, lettering size. So you can see here's YPT, there's YPU. And here we are now getting fueled up. And there's one doing a bit of a dive. And then here we've got an old Fordson tractor in the front with RAF markings on. I'd love to see that in colour to know what colour that tractor was. Was it green or was it blue? Um, Evelyn is written on the side of that one. So we've got another picture there. We can see all the weathering on there. Look at all the chipping on the paint and everything. It's just falling to bits. Wonderful. And then here, Francis is H. And there's one with the three numbers and three letters on the back, look, rather than on the front. It's interesting. Look how faded those roundels are. And here you can see we've got the, the thick yellow band around the, um, around the roundel. Keep that in mind. And these are these wonderful images. You can see they're weathered, which looks absolutely wonderful. I found something out this week that I never knew in my life. But if you, um, with roundels, because I was having a discussion about roundel size on wings, and apparently, we'll see if this works now. If you take the wingspan, okay, so the wingspan here is 120, 124, divide that 123, divide that by 3, okay, so a third of 123 is going to be, what's that, 41. And 41 should be the distance from the centre line to the centre of the round door. There you go. <laughs> and the round door will be sized to fit so that it's almost on the leading edge and doesn't touch the aileron. I never knew that because I was questioning. Somebody was telling me that a round on a Lancaster should be 84 inches. And actually it's around about 100 inches. And that's why they're, they're done to fit the wing. So... If I'm, if I'm wrong, please tell me, but that was what I was told. So, there we go. You can see the IF, IFF aerial there, and you can see here all the painting. And you can see here, when I talked about that wide band around the roundel here, they painted it out uh, in, in 1941. So they painted it out so that the... Um, so you only had the, the narrow yellow band. And there you are looking in the, uh, the glass nose front there. That's the angled one. Very interesting, quite cramped in there. You can see there's his shoulders, I and mean, it's got hardly any room to move. And here we are, a very interesting paint scheme. And this was doing some tests with um, UHF antennas. So you can see there's one image there, and there's one image there. So they're sort of trying to work out, you know, nobody really knows how they were. Also, of note, somewhere else in the book it tells you this here a lot of people would think that's the antenna would get where the antenna would go on the top of the tail. The antenna goes halfway up the fin. That's actually the uh, pitot tube. So worth bearing in mind. Here we have an aircraft with um, very, very worn uh, round doors, and you can see all the feet mark, the foot marks across the top. They've got the IFF antenna there, the big, big long exhaust, as we said earlier. And this here, C, is the AI aerial. Now, I, I've been back through and I can't find what AI stands for. So if anybody could tell me in the comments below, I'd be interested. Um, or is it A1 or is it AL? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm assuming it's AI. You can see here the big hedgehog exhaust, typical of British aircraft. And here we've got a gun nose on this one. And it's got the um, inset four, four doped over nose gun ports can be seen on the port side view of AH522. Oh, I can see them now. You can see the gun ports here. When you look there, they're all um, covered over with dope linen. So and there's the final picture there. You can see the little glazing through the side. Very nice indeed. So here we've got the turbo turbine lights, which are absolutely amazing. This was a massive, massive searchlight mounted on the front of the aircraft. And it had eight 
it does say in here somewhere 800,000 watts, equivalent to 8,100 watt domestic light bulbs, with an illumination time of around two minutes before the batteries were exhausted. It carried great big batteries in the um, in the bomb bay. So you can see here the front is sort of basically cut off, and it's got this great big glass glass dome or the glass nose on it. <laughs> Very interesting look. That'd be great for a resin conversion if anybody does a 30 second scale one of these. And uh, very interesting. But it would actually light up the sky. It tells you down here um, the light had an elliptical reflector that projected a horizontal beam of light with a 30 degree divergence, giving a light coverage 950 yards wide up to one mile ahead of the aircraft. I mean, God, you imagine seeing that coming at you. You ain't going to get escape that, are you? Again, you can see these uh, engine cover, engine cooling holes there. Here you've got the, the engine cover off. Some tatty old pictures there. We've got an extended ladder for the for the boarding hatch there for the rear the rear guy. And then we've got Royal Canadian Boston and uh, and intruders. So lovely picture there. Very clear, very nice picture. Looks like they're posing for that one. So we've got Winnipeg Winnipeg man. There's one for um, for Ron. <laughs> so. Uh, Based on its aircraft letter, many of 418 Squadron's Boston Mark III's were named after Canadian cities and provinces, such as on, on uh, THW named Winnipeg Man, Manitoba. So there we go. And you can see there's another doped over, um, doped linen covered gun port there. This guy's having a little chin wag. So some great pictures in this book to show you how to weather your A20, whatever, uh, whatever year you've got. So I'm sure they all weathered the same. You can see here the paint chipping and all the touch-ups and everything. It's amazing. You can see the twin, the twin Brownings there, twin 303s. And then here we've got some stenciling. You can see again there's that antenna. Look at the little short clear nose on that one. A clear tail, sorry, not nose. And then here, pito tube, antenna. See a picture there for, taken from the sky. Here we've got a very cold winter, so they've got the, the wings and the tail planes all covered up. I'm guessing that's so they can quickly uncover them and fly rather than wait for them to thaw. I remember sitting on the um, on the end of the runway at uh, Stuttgart having the aircraft cleaned with all this pink antifreeze they sprayed all over it to defrost it. You can see that big red sticker there that says fire extinguisher inside, which is pretty much typical for all, all the A20s, I think. So here we can see we've got armoured windscreen, external armour, so you know the variations you can get with this one aircraft is just incredible. You can see here beautifully weathered, this is gorgeous, that is beautifully weathered. Again you've got the modeller's notes, which is just what you want as a modeller. These books are made for modellers, they're brilliant. This is far better, I know it doesn't cover the A20G, but that book I've got, the, A the A20G that I paid about £58 for, this is way way better than that for you know for modeling but unfortunately it's no good for the a20g but certain aspects of it will be so yeah you can see there another beautiful black and white image we've got another image here you can see the machine gun at the front then we're on to day bombers there's a lovely straight on shot from the sky and a very rare shot of the um of the bomb bay with the four bombs in and you can see here the it mentions here interesting mechanism. It's a very, very simple mechanism. You've basically got rods on the sides here that attach to the bomb bay doors. Okay, so it's pivoted there and this is a hydraulic ram and it just pulls up. So as it pulls up, it pulls them up, which pulls the door shut. Really simple system. Very strong as well, I should think. Um, so here we've got now we're into Boston Mark III. You can see there's one with the turret there. What does it say about that? Uh, dum 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 dum. The Boston Three moved to the A and A at Boscombe Down for trials work, including the fitting of a power-operated dorsal turret, shown here in September '42. So there we are. Here's some great images coming now, guys. So this is a um, this is a Boston Three, and you can see it doesn't have the, the cooling holes. They're plated over. And you can see here some lovely colour images and all lined up and they're looking very, very clean in that in those photos. Whereas when you look over here, you can see, you know, you've got quite a lot of um, weathering going on 
you could really dirty them up and put some streaking on them and stuff. And then here over the page we've got another great picture, black and white, of RHA that is, isn't it? Yeah, it should have the A on the tail as well. And there she is, RHA, with the uh, flying pig on there. Beautiful. Beautiful. And then here we've got some aircraft all lined up for press photography. You see loads of them there in a line with some bomb trolleys here and everything. And you've got members of the public and people walking around. Very, very nice indeed. It's a good old book this. You can see some great weathering here. Great, great weathering ideas of how the hydraulic oil and the dirt and muck used to streak back. And I mean, this is all applicable to a G as well. You know, an A20G or whatever you want to build. It's... um. Very, very nice. Obviously, you won't have the porcupine exhaust or hedgehog exhaust. You've got the multiples, which is in here later. But look at the look at the weathering. Look how dirty they got. So, very nice. Very nice indeed. Some more beautiful weathering images there. And now we're on to the Boston Mark 3A. So again, we still don't have a turret, but we have twin machine guns. And now we've got the multiple exhausts you can see on here. Which are the same as the, I think they're the same as the A20G. Very similar if they're not the same. And then going over the page here. This is a special squadron. And you can see on the bottom here these pipes coming out. Um, and these were for putting down smoke screens. So you can see the pipes coming out of there. You can see them all here. And they have the white nose and the invasion stripes painted on. And that very roughly painted on as well. As can be seen here. You can see there's, there's one very low over the sea on D-Day. That's actually... Um, do, 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 do. Yeah, it was actually on D-Day. It was lost on the 12th of July. So, uh, sorry, that was this one. Lost on the 12th of July. That one was on D-Day. One or the other. And here you can see some painted on stripes. <laughs> you can see they're very, very rough. And uh, I've always thought it would be very, very difficult to replicate that on a, on a model. Um, I must see if I can do it. Because... Uh, I'm not sure if you could do it and make it look accurate, but make it like there's just not the fact that you can't paint. You know what I mean? Be uh, very difficult to do. So here's one here. We've got a nose art there. Beer is best. I'll go along with that every day of the week. That's brilliant. And then here we've got the uh, the exhaust outlets there. That's like on the J, isn't it? Uh, -dum 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 -dum. Clayton S type exhaust. Yeah, I think that's what the J has got, these, these external little lumps here. You can see them there as well. Again, you can see there's really roughly painted on stripes. There's the door there for the, uh, for the lower gun. And then here we go. We've got a lovely aerial image. And these are Boston Mark 3A and Mark 4 aircraft. You can see the 3As with the gun and you can see the, the 4s with the turrets. There's one mixture there. So we can see here, um, going across, we've got the Boston Mark IV. Um, and it's telling me this is something I've always wondered with these English aircraft. And I'd love to know, you know, it tells us here with this one, but, you know, a, a, a Corsair III, what is that? You know, or a Wildcat IV, or we didn't even call a Wildcat, did we? Um, the, when the British took on American aircraft, they gave them different names. The A-20 series was incrementally improved and on mid-June 1944, the first Boston Mark IVs were delivered to the RAF. Over 250 of the Mark IV, which is the A-20J, and generally similar Mark V, A-20K, served with the second TAF and in Task Air Force and in Italy. I think it's Task Air Force, isn't it? So, um, so we've got a Mark IV illustrating the distinctive clear glazed nose, the one piece, uh, and multi-pot exhausts. Okay, you can see those on there. The streamlined long-range 300 US gallon fuel tank was plumbed into auxiliary tanks fitted in the bomb, bomb bay to increase the range for Atlantic crossings and was not used in operations. So that was only for um, tax uh, for um, getting them over here. Uh, it was delivered in US olive drab and neutral grey. In total, 169 Mark IVs were supplied to the RAF. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. 10th of May 1944, you can see that one down there. And we can see it's got two um, 50 cals, the Boston Mark IV, served with two second TAF squadrons in northwest Europe. But the generally similar Mark V that used twin Cyclone R2600 2900 served only in Italy. 
So there we are. So the forthcoming A20J. Um, I know that Neil is very much wanting to put an RAF version in that boxing. Um, now I'm sure if Neil doesn't, then I'm sure that uh, somebody will be doing decals, aftermarket masks, whatever. So you can actually do an RAF Boston Mark IV from that kit. And I'm sure it would be easy enough to do. Also of note, I've spoken to Neil about the nose wheel. I think he may be correcting it for the, uh, for the A20J. Um, so you can see here another image underneath. So newly delivered Boston Mark IV. You can see it's newly delivered. Look at it. It's, already it's all pretty much weathered. You can see the um, underneath the three ID lights. They're much closer together than we've got them on the kit. So I'm not sure was this particular to the Americans or, or, or is this incorrect or what. I'll, I'll wait for you to tell me in the comments. Um, but we can see here beautiful uh, aircraft. As you can see all quite dirty already even though it's, it's brand new. So left an Olive Drab Mark IV, a 342 squadron. You can see again we've got the invasion stripes painted on. Here's another one with a great big whip antenna on the nose. And then here Boston Mark IV, BZ452, OAE, 342 squadron, October 1944. Very nice indeed. Fully glazed nose and power operated dorsal turret. Finished with olive drab upper surfaces, medium green blotches and neutral grey undersides. Red, white, blue, French round doors and worn in six positions. The dull red unit codes and aircraft letter confirmed to RAF practice. Although aircraft letter E on the nose is shaded probably in yellow. There we go. And then fleet air arm, air arm. Some were actually sent over to the fleet air arm for them to use. And then here at the back of the book, as we always get in these wonderful, wonderful books, we have Boston and Havoc unit code letters and Boston and Havoc serials. Many early deliverers randomly converted to intruder, Pandora and turbine flight, turbine light configuration. Something I did learn from Mark, which is probably covered in this book when I was at Telford, apparently you will have early Bostons in UK service that are newer than later ones and the reason was is when Germany took over France the English got all the French ones or all the French deliveries which were actually earlier aircraft but they were later so if you know what I mean it was like you know they, they, they had a load of Cortina Mark 1s okay in France and they had a load on order and Britain went straight in and bought the Cortina Mark II. And then when the, when France fell, in the UK took on the French ones. So they had newer aircraft that were older. So they had Mark II Cortinas here. And then later on, they got Mark I Cortinas. So there you go. Apparently that's what happened. But anyway, lovely, lovely book. One of the best, I think. Um, fantastic subject. Extremely interesting really really good to have by the side of the bed for some bedtime reading because it is just absolutely packed with information that certainly I'd never heard of I know a lot of you won't have either there's going to be obviously experts out there that know absolutely everything there is to know but um I'm certainly not one of those so there we go well worth getting I'll show you again there's the ISBN code number should you wish to order it elsewhere but I would order it if you're in the UK, particularly even anywhere in the world. The postage is very reasonable and I'm told the delivery is very fast. But www.wingleader.co.uk, RRP 1995. Brilliant. Right. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all soon. As I said, I'm working on the A20 now, so I should have parts 16 up very shortly. Bye for now.